Hello guys, Charles here and welcome back to my channel. So I got a question quite a while ago, sorry it's taken me so long to get back to you. But the question was about this book here, A Chromatic Approach to Jazz Harmony and Melody by Dave Liebman and what Dave Liebman's approach is and whether the book's worth buying or not. So let's have a quick chat about that today. To give you the answer up front, the book is absolutely fantastic for certain students. That's gonna be the conclusion here. But I just wanna give you a quick breakdown of what the book's about, what's useful about it, what might not be so useful for some people, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So the first thing to say is that although it's a really big book, as you can see, I mean, we're on, what, 200 and something pages here, 220, 220 odd pages, a lot of stuff. It's actually only probably about 70 pages of content, um, and I'll explain exactly what I mean by that in a moment, but it's split into three sections generally. The first 70 or 80 odd pages are the actual material, the, the, the lesson stuff, learning new ideas. The second probably 100 odd pages is about looking at examples. So we've got examples from Herbie Hancock, we've got examples from Dave Liebman himself, we've got examples from Randy Brecker, all sorts of, of, of big names. Uh, and then finally, there's kind of a reference at the end which gives us 100 chromatic I hesitate to use the word licks, but 100 chromatic melodies and 100 polychords. So Dave Liebman's approach is far harder to nail down than Garzon, which is why really I'm not going to do a demonstration video or anything along those lines. I just want to kind of explain it to you. Because for those who have been playing a while and are maybe more advanced players, you've probably tackled most of the material in this book already. By which I mean there's so much content available now on the internet that you've probably at least dipped your toe into most of the ideas. However, what Dave Liebman does really well is kind of lay them out in a, a logical fashion. And one of the things which is worth the price of admission alone are these pages, this type of page here, which I don't know if you can see, but it's a page of here's the original chord progression and every single stave is some substitutions. And that's very much the way that Dave Liebman's approach works. It's looking at a chord progression and looking at options for chord superimposition or substitutions. And he talks about all of these examples, how to apply them in a tonal and a modal setting, a more pedal context, and then completely free tonality as well. So you really get a lot of context for each of these examples. You also get a lick to learn for several of them as well. And in terms of an approach, that's probably the best summary of it, is it's superimposition over the changes. And Dave Liebman's kind of uh, said that himself in, in interviews as well. That's his approach is, okay, that's the chord progression. Which other chords could I fit over the top? So some common examples he gives is using any 2-5 instead of the 2-5 in a 2-5-1, if that makes sense. So you can use any 2-5, for example, you could go, G, C, and then resolve to D. Or you could go G, C, and then resolve to E flat. Swapping out the two, five, and just trying all those different ideas out. He also talks about applying Coltrane changes over two, five, ones again, but in other situations also. And then he also talks about how to play in an interesting and outside, but not predictable fashion over single chord vamps or pedals, such as, you know, footprints, that sort of thing. The takeaway from that is try and use non-functional harmony over the top of pedals because as soon as you start going through the cycle of fifths, as soon as you get locked into that, it sounds very predictable and I suppose almost a little bit corny or lame, which doesn't suit the, the modal aesthetic. Now the second part of the book, the transcriptions and analysis, this is really what probably most people who are watching this will be into because the sort of people who are interested in it probably have already got their basics down. So. If you are someone who feels, yeah, I can play over changes, I can outline chords using arpeggios and scales, and of course you need to be able to do that because the whole point of superimposing a chord structure over another one is you need to be able to really clearly outline what that superimposed structure is. So you need to be sure that you can play really confidently over basic chord progressions before you approach this stuff. But seeing these analysis, or analyses I should say, over all sorts of solos. We've got John Coltrane here, uh, we've got classical excerpt, excerpt from Bach, we've got Chopin, we've got Scriabin, Schoenberg, we've got 
uh, Dave Liebman playing over softly as in a morning sunrise, so on and so forth. Like I say, we've got some Herbie in there, we've got some Randy, all sorts of stuff. And a thorough transcription of the solo, which really, if you just sat down and learned all these all the solos in here, I mean, you'd be an absolute beast. But also, Dave has added analysis and annotations, so he's explaining exactly what's going on. And then the final thing that's discussed heavily in this book is polychords. So polychords have a variety of definitions, and Dave goes through all the possible types in this book. He talks about how to solo over them, and then at the end of the whole book, we get a vocabulary list of 100 phrases and 100 polychords, interesting sounding chords. So just to really be clear about who this book is for, it is not for someone who's just getting into jazz. It's far too, I mean, it's very simple. I don't wanna make it sound complicated, but you've gotta have a basic understanding of what's going on in playing over changes already. So it's, it's a little bit beyond that stage, but it's actually very accessible. If you're not really a big theory person, it's still a very good read. And there's a, there's a lot of text in here written in a very casual way, so it's very easy to read through. And then there's loads and loads of examples for you to play or simply to read. On that note, the edition I've got here comes with online download of all the audio examples of most of the stuff in the book. And as far as I'm aware, the price of the book doesn't actually say, I can't remember how much I paid for it, but 20 or 30 quid, something like that. I don't think the price is any different. So having those audio examples is a game changer. If you've had this book since the, the 80s, I think, when it was first published, buy the new versions simply to access those because reading about it's one thing, but hearing about them is completely another. If you are someone who's a more confident player and you're interested in getting into the chromatic stuff, I'd probably recommend you don't go straight into this one because it's less of a method. It's less of a do this, then do that, do that. I'd probably recommend you start with the George Garzone stuff because the George Garzone stuff is step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. Now you're playing outside. And I think that's really, really important to just have that really simple approach. There's probably too much to get started with in this book, I think. But once you've got those Garzone sounds in your head and maybe you've listened to loads of outside music and you want to now start to understand it a bit better and have a, a method to work through, I think, you know, this is probably a good, well, it's a lifetime's work, but really to work your way through it in, in one go would probably be at least a few months or a year to really internalize it. So really, I'd recommend you go through the Garzone approach first, and then this would be something I'd suggest next. But again, if you are someone who is fascinated by the world of outside stuff, you've probably encountered most of the topics discussed in this book already. So don't be expecting to open it and have your mind blown. That's not a criticism of Dave Liebman by any stretch of the imagination. It's the fact that this book has been so impactful on jazz education that you've likely heard it secondhand by now in the year 2022 or whatever we're in, 2021. You've probably heard some of these ideas secondhand by now anyway, but Dave was the first person to really codify them and, and put them down. So he should get the credit, but you're unlikely to buy the book and be completely mind blown by every single thing. But no doubt hearing him talking about these things and demonstrating these things, reading his thoughts on the transcriptions is hugely insightful. So I do still think this is well worth the value of entry for the audio examples and the transcriptions alone if you're already a confident player. Even if you already know absolutely everything in this book, those are still fantastic resources to have. So for me, when I first got the book, I read it through cover to cover, and now I'm kind of just dipping into it every now and then, and I've added a lot of the tracks into my regular listening, including just some of the example things, because Dave's such an unbelievable player. And really, the way Dave plays often excuses some of the outrageous chromaticism. So you might find you try some of the ideas in the book and it just, to you, doesn't sound very good. Um, that's been happening with me as well. And of course, it's because Dave has that insane pocket and that insane tone that he manages to get away with these things. So keep working on those elements if you're playing as well, because they can really help to justify some of the more outrageous suggestions within the book. So I hope you found that useful. Of course, I don't want to be giving away any of the secrets or anything like that within the book. That's not really my place to do. But hopefully that overview there is slightly useful for you and you maybe have a better idea if it's worth diving into this book now or not. I would recommend it to everyone, of course, because it's just a fantastic book. However, hopefully I've given you a better idea of if it's appropriate exactly for your current level of progress yet or not. And one thing I would say is I always say to my students, if they already have a good standard of guitar and a good standard of amplifier, invest your money in 
good plectrums, good strings, and good education. There are so many things people want you to buy. You'll notice I try my best not to be a gear channel here, although I do occasionally, when I get something that's really nice, I do occasionally make a video about it. But I try my best to have very little gear. I have my lovely Kiesel guitar, my lovely Henriksen amp, I have a Holdsworth drive pedal, and that is it. That's all I have, uh, and I'm very happy with all that. Now, that's not to say there's not some things I want, but before that, I will continue investing in my education nice plectrums and nice strings, because those are the things that really make a difference. If you found that one useful, please do give it a like, subscribe, ding that notification bell, and share with any of your friends who need some dirty outside lines in their life. And as always, I hope you're all doing very well, getting plenty of practice in, and I very much look forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers. Roll up, roll up, let me embed a story you'll never forget. A drip, drip, a drowning in debt now. You can't buy your way out.